depending on which way you look at it, it's either Orson Welles or William Randolph Hearst that caused these two horror movies to happen. William Randolph Hearst was a newspaper man. He owned tons of newspapers. He was incredibly powerful in the media. He was basically Rupert Murdoch before Rupert Murdoch. And then in 1939-1940, a 26-year-old wunderkind made a movie called Citizen Kane. That's where Orson Welles comes in. And Hearst did everything he could to bury it. He offered to buy the picture. He had his people review it harshly in his newspapers. He basically did everything he could to stop the movie from becoming known to the public because it was pretty clearly evident that the movie was based on him. RKO, the movie studio that did Citizen Kane, put a ton of money into it and didn't get that money back, so they were going broke. And so they started a second unit, a B-picture unit, run by a producer called Val Luton. By the way, Val Luton wasn't his real name. His real name was Vladimir Ivanovich Hofschneider. That was Val Luton's real name, and of course he anglicised it. He did the Ellis Island thing in America. He was a novelist, he was a producer. He was basically a genius at the art form of cinema. And he took on board a second-generation film director called Jacques Tourneur, who was French. And between them, they made a bunch of movies for RKO on crazily limited budgets, which are extraordinary pieces of cinema. So let's talk about that this time around. Let's talk about Cat People first, because it came first. It was made in 1942, based on a script by DeWitt Bodine, and it's something special. It was a sequel in 1944 called The Curse of the Cat People and a 1982 remake directed by Paul Schrader, which I haven't seen for a long time, but I probably should re-watch. Simone Simon plays a Serbian-born fashion illustrator, Irina Dubrovna, who's making sketches of a Black Panther in Central Park Zoo. She meets a marine engineer called Oliver Reed, played by Kent Smith, and they strike up a conversation in the apartment, he sees that she's got a statue of a medieval warrior on horseback impaling a large cat with a sword. Irina tells him that it's a Serbian legend from her area. The figure is King John of Serbia, and he drove out evil people from her village, amongst whom were a group of Satan worshippers who became cat people. The relationship develops, and Irina and Oliver get married, but she doesn't consummate the marriage because she thinks that she is one of the cat people and that if she becomes sexually aroused though that's not really talked about in that detail she will turn into a giant cat and kill the person she's with this puts a certain limitation on the relationship uh, some other weird things happen she becomes obsessed with the panther in the zoo and when she has a cage bird which dies of fright she feeds it to the panther i'm not kidding you that's what happens and also, uh, during the wedding feast in a Serbian restaurant, a cat-like woman walks over and says to her, Moya Sestra, my sister. Moya Sestra. Moya Sestra. One of the women who works in the office with Oliver, Alice, played by Jane Randolph, is in love with him. And there, she's kind of a sounding board for the problems he's having in his marriage. And they become closer and closer. And also, Irena becomes more jealous, even before anything develops in the relationship. To save the marriage, Irena goes to see a psychiatrist called Dr. Louis Judd, played by Tom Conway, who was... George Sanders' brother in real life, so you know he's going to play a cad. Dr. Judd hypnotizes her and finds out a lot about her. He also wants to sleep with her. Again, this is 1942, so it's not laid out in those terms, but it's the essence of what happens. The movie runs a really tight 73 minutes. It cost $135,000 to make, which was nothing in those days. It's even less than nothing now. And the thing that Tourneur and Luton did that really makes this a breakthrough piece of cinema is that they couldn't really show a woman turning into a cat and they wanted to leave some ambiguity there so it's all done with shadows and light it's done with smart editing it's done with sound design in fact this is the movie that gave us the jump scare the famous Luton bus <laughs> a 
in the scene in the swimming pool where Alice is swimming and is menaced by something she can't see and only hears and sees shadows of, it's another way in which Luton and Tourneur built the atmosphere and built a kind of hermetic world around the story. This is something the two movies I'm going to talk about have in common. The world building in them is subtle and powerful as well. The legends that Arena tells Oliver about are a part of that. And Arena's, well, let's call it romantic reticence, all will build this world where there are beings walking amongst us who aren't human. And I really like that. I like the way that's played. I like the way it's suggested. And students of film really need to see this movie if they haven't already. They probably have. It's probably on every curriculum because it shows what you can do on a limited budget by using your imagination and by subtly but continually world building throughout the narrative. And this movie does that really well. And the film nearly didn't get made the way it was supposed to be made. Tourneur was almost fired three days into shooting after an executive, Lou Ostro, saw the daily rushes. He called Val Luton and told him to fire the director. According to Tourneur, Luton subsequently contacted the head of the studio who viewed the raw unedited footage of the film and countermanded that order. Simone Simon was a bit of a handful too. She had a horrible temper and she had a shouty match with Jacques Tourneur in French while they were filming it. And Tourneur reused a lot of things from other movies as well. The staircase you see going up to Arena's apartment is left over from the other project that Orson Welles did for RKO, The Magnificent Ambersons. Rewatching Cap People now, it, it's still great. It's the world building, the start of the romance, the unhappy marriage that Oliver and Irina have plays quite well. People didn't talk about divorce and unhappy marriages and sexual incompatibility in 1940 cinema. This movie does, in an oblique way, address those things and addresses um, the kind of loneliness that both characters experience because of that. Now, it's a really adult film, not in, not in a, any kind of sexual sense, but it's a, a grown-up film and a sophisticated film. For that reason, a lot of that stuff would have been jettisoned in a lesser production. But it becomes a core part of the narrative that even though the, there's that initial romance and there's that initial love thing, and we get the impression that Oliver isn't a very sophisticated guy, the idea that Irina um, is scared of sex for reasons that become obvious late in the film is really something that a horror movie, and particularly a B-horror movie, didn't normally address in those days. B-horror movie pictures tended to be a bit obvious and a bit kind of down market. And this movie is neither of those things. And although the movie was made for 135000 it ended up making over a million dollars at the box office, so everybody was really happy with it. Valentin's unit went on to make a whole bunch of other films after this, of course, I Walk With a Zombie, The Leopard Man, The Seventh Victim, The Ghost Shoot, Curse of the Cat People, the Body Snatcher, Isle of the Dead, and Bedlam, amongst other things. And of course, that scene's referenced in one of the early scenes in one of my favourite films, The Bad and the Beautiful, where Barry Sullivan and Kirk Douglas are trying to work out how to make a cheap horror movie when they first start out in Hollywood. Cat People is really an influential film. Of course, Paul Schrader's remake is totally different and in some ways a lot more obvious. But for me, it's a movie I can go back to every couple of years and just enjoy again. It did get a Criterion release, and I think that that's justified. It's filmed almost entirely on a soundstage, and yet it gives us the sense of New York. It gives us a sense of weather as well. There are times when it's raining, there are times when it's snowing, there are times when the wind is blowing. And this is something that Luton's unit and, and Tourneur continued in their other films as well, giving the impression of being outdoors and of weather and how the weather affects people while you're on a sound stage is quite an achievement. In 1943, Luton and Tonneau made, for me, their most interesting movie together. I Walk With a Zombie, which is a reinterpretation of Jane Eyre, set on a Caribbean island with voodoo. And it's just such a wonderfully detailed world that's created 
in this movie apart from some scenes on beaches it's all done on on a set francis d plays betsy connell a nurse who is sent to a caribbean island san sebastian to look after the infirmed wife of a of a sugar plantation owner paul holland played by tom conway Tom has a half-brother, Wesley, played by James Ellison, and his mother, Mrs. Rand, also lives in the plantation. Do you know what this is? Figure of St. Sebastian. Yes. But it was once the figurehead of a slave ship. That's where our people came from, from the misery and pain of slavery. For generations, they found life a burden. That's why they still weep when a child is born and make merry at a burial. The first day the nurse, Betsy, is on the island, she doesn't see her patient. She sees a woman in a white robe walking around the gardens and into a tower on the property. It turns out that Mrs. Holland has, they think, some kind of encephalitis, which she's mobile, she can walk around, she can eat and drink. Mrs. Holland had a tropical fever, very severe. We might say that portions of the spinal cord were burned out by this fever. The result is what you see, a woman without any willpower unable to speak or even act by herself. She meets Wesley for lunch one day and hears a local Calypso song, which is sung about the history of the Holland family and the love triangle between Wesley, Paul, and the now comatose Jessica Holland. This movie builds up such an eerie and melancholy atmosphere as well. There are the constant drums, there is the sound of wind blowing through drought-dried sugarcane fields. It's wonderfully evocative and wonderfully creepy, and the world-building here is subtle. The island people are at least as important to the narrative as the white people. And we find out that one of the characters has found a way to incorporate the belief systems of the natives with modern medicine as a way of helping them. After insulin therapy doesn't help Mrs. Holland, Betsy then turns to the local voodoo beliefs as a way of trying to help her. I'd rather think of her as a sleepwalker who can never be awakened. Feeling nothing, knowing nothing. One of the housemaids tells her that the Hungan, the local voodoo priest, has cured a woman with a similar ailment to Mrs. Holland. And so Betsy takes Mrs. Holland to the home for the the voodoo ritual place and is led there by a tall gaunt unseeing figure called Carrefour played by Darby Jones who's the iconic image for the movie <laughs> Carrefour is an interesting name for it too because Carrefour is a crossroads in French and in a sense Carrefour escorts Betsy in the world between the living and the dead. There are so many different conflicting currents in this movie. There's the white plantation owners versus the native people or the people who became natives because their ancestors were brought there as slaves. There's the living and the dead. There's the conflict between science and belief systems that are not based on logic. For a very much a big picture, this is a sophisticated movie in the same way that Cat People is, in fact, even more so. It deals with things like racism and slavery, though not to any great depth, but they are part of the fabric and the texture. And the people of colour who are in it, the black people, are treated with respect and treated with compassion. And that's not something you always saw in 1943 in particularly Hollywood cinema. Uh, it gave roles to actors of colour, though they weren't paid particularly well. And Darby Jones as Carrefour is an incredible presence in this film. And I think that respect makes the movie really accessible to a modern audience. There are so many movies of this time where the race relations that are portrayed in the film are really despicable. <laughs> it's the only way to say it is despicable. But this movie doesn't do that. This movie, made by people who were born in America, you got to remember these guys are immigrants, could see from outside race relations from a totally different angle. And that makes this movie more important than many other big pictures of its time. And the interesting thing is that the Holland Rand family, the three people, the two half-brothers, and their mother, are scarred by the legacy 
of their privilege in this film. And that makes it just that little bit more interesting as well. The people, the native people, the, the people who are the descendants of slaves are part of a community. They're, they've got their beliefs. They're, they've got family. There's a new baby born into one of the servants' families. They have a sense of togetherness and a sense of who they are, much more than the three people in the white family in there who are in some ways tearing one another apart. And again, that's a, that's a subtext that you don't often see in this kind of film from this particular era. It's a really great film. Does it play well as a horror movie for modern audiences? Probably not. The atmosphere is very creepy and the world building is first rate. But I think that this movie is more about the burden of history and the burden of privilege and also the sadness of grief and of secrets kept. From what I understand at the time, people were terrified when they saw Darby Jones in this movie. Is he a zombie or not? Who knows? It, if he is the guardian, if he is the guardian between living and the dead, is he the zombie or is the other character that uh, seems to be a zombie a zombie? Or are they both zombies? It's a, it's a hard one to answer. This movie creates a unique world, and I think that that's one of the main virtues of it. And they did some smart things too. They got Sir Lancelot, who was a Calypso singer, to play the main Calypso singer in there. Sorry, the battery went out on the camera. Just to finalise on I Walk With A Zombie, I love the world building. I love the fact that a low-budget unit in a minor Hollywood studio can make a movie this complex and this nuanced and this respectful of race in, a, in the 1940s. I think that that's probably something that we should be watching for in cinema, particularly modern cinema. Look for the outliers. Look for the ones that are ahead of the game. Look for the ones that 30, 40, 50 years from now are going to be the movies that are respected. And they're not necessarily going to be the blockbusters. They're not going to be the big films. They're going to be the little ones on the edges, the outliers, the voices that aren't normally heard that are going to give us the cinema that we respect in the future. And I think that there are some lessons there in the Val Lute and Jacques Tourneur movies of the way that outsiders can have such a positive influence on cinema and give us movies that, what is it, almost 80 years after they were made are still respected and loved and enjoyed by audiences. That's part of what I love about being a film buff. So thank you very much for watching. As always, please consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell, and leave me a comment about what you think of I Walk With A Zombie and Cat People. Uh, have you seen the remake recently? I haven't seen the remake. I'm waiting until I can get a decent copy of it. But um, I remember mostly some imagery from the remake rather than the, the whole thing in, of itself. But uh, I may do more Jacques Tourneur, Val Luton movies in future. Let me know if you want to see another double feature of the output of this extraordinary little unit in RKO Studios. As always, look after yourselves. We are in our sixth lockdown at the moment. Hopefully it's only going to go for a week. We've had an outbreak of Delta variant here and that's not what we want. So look after yourselves. Wear a mask when you go out and if somebody doesn't like that, too damn bad. Watch some good movies. Watch some old movies. Definitely watch some Val Lute and Jacques Tourneau movies. They are worth it every time. And I'll catch you next time.